The Dice Tower, Episode 434. Hype, 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 hype! Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Jeff tries to keep us from exploding, Brian has the blues, and both Dan and Tom Kendrick update us on their ongoing board game groups. Plus, we have a new type of tale, Tom tells us about the GTS Common Play Day, and we all share our strategies for dealing with board game hype. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the human hype machine himself, Tom Vassell. I don't think I'm the human hype machine. You have to admit that you play a pretty big role in keeping this whole thing rolling. You know what, though? I have my hype machineness has gone down some and has been taking up by some other people because I talk about new games and upcoming games, but I'm talking about games that are coming out usually within a three month radius. And True. the Kickstarter promoters are talking about things that are coming out 12 to 18 months out. Okay. So I'm considering myself less hyping. <laughs> uh, sure. You got it. No, but I mean – and and really I'm, I'm trying to work that way because, I mean, a lot of the games we're talking about in the show and, in fact, we're about to talk about some games in a moment are games that are out now or out very soon. Right. The goal is to try and, you know, point you towards something that you can at least pretty soon get your hands on. Well, folks, this is kind of an unusual episode for us in a sense that we are recording this one much earlier than we normally do. We recorded this one almost a month ago. <laughs> I know, um, yeah, this is very strange because in the timeline, in your timeline, gentle listener, Board Game Geek Con has already happened. And it was amazing! It, we, we are assuming it's amazing. For us, uh, us time travelers, we are uh, <laughs> we're, we're before Board Game Geek Con so far. Right. So if you're wondering why we're not talking about certain things, um, uh, that, that, that may be why. <laughs> yeah, all the, just, uh, that crazy thing that happened at Board Game Geek Con, whew, man, I just can't even talk about it. So don't forget, um, we appreciate everyone who listens to our show and, and watches our show. We have a video show. You can find all our stuff at Dicetower.com. There is um, promos if you ever want to see those there we have other podcasts that i always want to talk about we have our news podcast the dice tower news podcast and you can find that at dicetowernews.com you that, that's our written news but our dice tower podcast is also there follow us on twitter and instagram i'm always tweeting something or i try to and take pictures every once in a while when i think about it <laughs> dice tower deluxe i want to talk to you guys about dice tower deluxe briefly if you're listening to this on dice tower deluxe then I need to warn you, the end is nigh. Oh, no. Um, you need to start subscribing to regular Dice Tower because we are going to be shutting down the Dice Tower Deluxe station probably by the end of 2015. Dice Tower Deluxe, for those of you who are listening and wondering what we're talking about, uh, we were using the enhanced podcast version uh, that Apple had out where you could play it on different Apple devices and it would show pictures and it had chapter breaks and things. And it worked very cool. It was very neat, but there was a couple problems. One, it doesn't work on many devices, usually only Apple devices. Mm -hmm. And two, Apple has been very they, – they haven't supported it much at all and I suspect they're going to shut it down. Hmm. And three, I'm going to try this. It may not work very well. We're going to try to post our audio as a YouTube video and put a couple pictures in the background there. Interesting. I do not know. I guess we could put chapter breaks in there too, but that's – we'd have to use annotations and stuff. I don't know. That hmm. might not work so well. I think – can you put chapter breaks in YouTube videos? I think you might be able to. I have no idea. What is this making videos you speak of? Well, that's a good question, Eric. Aren't you like required to make a video by the end of this year? Uh, no, I don't think I promised that. I did. I did my top one hundred. Yeah, but didn't you like say you would do a video review this year? I hope not. Well, let's just say you did. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. 
Doesn't everyone here like Eric to do video reviews? Start a thread. Tell everyone he needs to do more video reviews. I would love to. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying I would love to. <laughs> All right. So anyway, that's where we are with Dice Tower Deluxe. And speaking of the videos, some of the videos we do audio versions. And if you like to just listen to those, you can find that at Dice Tower Audio. Dot com, and that's basically like when me, uh, Sam, and Z do top ten lists or board game breakfast and such. You can hear those audio versions of those. Hey, speaking of other things, though, Eric, we have a shout out from who? From Jockin or Joshin. He says, "Please give a shout out to my girlfriend Magda. I want to thank her for playing so many board games with me and for letting me fill our flat with game boxes eventually." This feels very similar to a shout-out we've done before. <laughs> yes. And Steven says to the Chandler Gamers, thank you so much for being a great game group. You've brought much fun and friends to my life. Thank you guys for supporting our show in the Kickstarter this year. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, this is a show about hype. So, Eric, tell us about a brand-new game that we've never heard of before. I will. Got to play Sleuth. Recently, this is Wait, the what? Yeah, classic sleuth? Sid Saxon card game of deduction. And what I wanted wanted to talk about is because it's been a while since I'd actually played Sleuth. And you know, in the game, you you take one card out of the deck, and you're trying to figure out what card that is. And it has a property of a a solitaire or a a, a dual one, two, or three gems, uh, or what type of gem it is and what color it is. And you're trying to figure this out based on what the other players have in their hand. And Trying to figure out a note-taking system for this game always baffles me. And every time I play it, I'm like, this is the way I'm going to take notes next time I play it. And then when I play it again, I um, forget what I (laughs) had figured out before. And I'm back to square one trying to figure out, how am I going to take notes? Because you want to pay attention to what other players are asking and also what answers you received for your questions. And ultimately, you're trying to figure out what cards are in each other's uh, hands and... I felt like I was making more progress and actually trying to... I had nailed down a couple of players' hands. Exactly. I know they've got these five cards. Uh, but then somebody beat me to the, the win. I, I, I still... I don't think I've ever won this game. Maybe once. Um, it's still a great challenge and one of my favorite deduction games. Sleuth. Still liking it. Still baffling. It's really interesting that the note-taking in this game dramatically differs depending on the number of players. Hmm. I found that if I play with five players, note taking isn't so bad. Okay. Because with four other players, I can use a corner of the, the box. Corner of the boxes, yes. For each player, which works until about two thirds through the game, and then I'm like, wait, what am I doing? I don't know anything. I'm just I writing stuff my notation. Down. Yeah. Um, or even you know, with with four or three players, that same notation works. Yep. When you add the six player, and I've played this with the seven players, which by the way, folks, is insanity. It's crazy. And then I'm like, okay, so I have four corners, and now the middle of the box. <laughs> which player is the middle? It's going to be Jim, I, I, yep. right? Okay, it's him, I think, right? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I'm seriously considering playing this at BGG Con because it's been a while. Yeah. And I think you know a lot of guys in my group would hate this game. But I, I think I think I can find some people at BGCon who would like it. Yeah. Oh, Maybe I have game. played it already at BGCon. Maybe. Woo. Above <laughs> and Below Oh, is a game I'm talking about here. This is a game from Red Raven Games, designed by Ryan Lockett, uh, illustrated by Ryan Lockett, mm-hmm. graphic design Ryan Lockett, published yep. by Ryan Lockett. Yes. We're going to say that about every single game that Red Raven does. It. Well, he's got to publish games other people do. I think he is. Maybe. But anyhow, this is a game in which you are – it's a worker placement game where you're going to be using different workers. Not worker placement, but you're going to be using different workers to do different actions, to build buildings, to hire other workers, and to go on adventures. When you send workers out on adventures, you open a big book of stories just like the one that you would find in Tales of Arabian Nights. Ooh. I will read you a story. I'll say, Eric, you meet an old lady who is sitting sadly by a lake. Do you stop to help her or do you go on and find treasure? So he makes the the choice of which one he's going to do. And then he needs to get a certain number of explore tokens to succeed. And 
he has to do that by rolling dice, and that's based on the skills of the people who come. It's a little easier to show this than it is to talk about it. You can see it in my video review. Uh, this then gives some sort of result, usually good, but you're, you have a reputation track, and that reputation track will usually suffer or go up based on what you've done. So like if you ignore the old lady, your reputation will probably go down. But you <laughs> might find some cool treasure. <laughs> if you help, your reputation might go up, and you might find treasure, and you might not. The game is a very strong Euro game, though. You're trying to get different goods, and those give you points. You're trying to build buildings that give you points. And going on adventures is kind of just a side thing to the game. It's still a little random. Not a super cohesive story you're going to find here. But I liked it. I, I'm not like in love with it like everyone – a lot of people are like, oh, this is the greatest storytelling game ever. It <laughs> is a good storytelling game. It's a very solid game. Um, but the adventuring thing to me almost seems like a – it doesn't seem like the main focus of the game. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to explain that. Like when you go out, you get random stuff. I might want to just build something I know I'm going to get something better from. Hmm. But still, very solid game. I think it has great artwork. There's a lot going on. This is certainly one I recommend you try before you buy, but I did like it. That's above and below. Hmm. I'm impressed you, you got this one done so quickly. I just got my copy of this, but, but hearing you talk about it, I'm, I'm actually quite excited to try it, especially since my son has recently discovered Choose Your Own Adventure books at his library and has been bringing a few home, and we've been reading them for, like, story time at night. So this is kind of the perfect time to strike for this one. Well, let me ask this, because what you just said intrigues me. Do you let him choose the – like, do you read and then let him make the choices? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. What happens that – in those games, there was a lot of horrible deaths. How does yes. he handle that? Uh, I don't think the, – the ones we've read so far don't have horrible deaths. It's more, you know, you get in big trouble. Um, but – we often will, if we, if we get a bad ending, we'll rewind one choice and just do the other path. But I usually only let him do one run each night. <laughs> you know, I've read some of those books recently, and I love those as kids. But wow, the writing in those books, there's some pretty bad writing. It's not stellar. And sometimes they, they like just come to a very abrupt end. <laughs> yes. The adventure ones, though, like the, the fantasy adventure sword and sorcery ones, those are the ones you can die in. Uh, those space ones, I died. I know I died. That's true. Next up for me, I, I have raved already about uh, Paperback, the world-building, word-building, deck-building game. But there is a cooperative mode in Paperback, uh, which my son and I have enjoyed. In, in the basic game, you're sort of building your deck and trying to acquire these point cards, uh, these, these novels that you have written, and the more you have paid for them, the more they're worth, and they go into your deck and they sort of add uh, some, some wild cards into your deck for future play. In the co-op version, you build a pyramid out of these cards, sort of working your way up to the more difficult uh, to, to acquire cards up at the top. And they're laid out like a, a solitaire uh, you know, grid or the Seven Wonders dual grid where you have to uncover cards before you can interact with them. Each turn of the game, you place a marker on one of the exposed cards, one of the available cards. And once a card has... I think it's when it, you place the fifth or when it has five and you need to place another one on it, you lose. Um, so you have to sort of manage your resources in acquiring these cards to clear them of cubes and open up more cards for you to place cubes on, but also building up your deck. So how do you place the cubes? Where, where do you put them? Do you put a bunch on one card so you can clear them all at once? When do you uh, to make the decision to clear those cubes? It's sort of a pressure luck, too, because if you don't get a large enough uh, word on the turn when it's your job to clear some of those cubes and buy a card, then you're going to lose. So you can't let it go too long, but you also need to build up those cubes a little bit while you build up your deck. It offers some interesting decisions, and it's a neat way to play Paperback, a game I already enjoyed in its competitive mode, but the co-op is pretty cool, too. I don't know if you talked me into that or not. Hmm. Because I usually am like, why would I change this game to a co-op? But I just did that with Orleans and played that co co yeah. cooperatively, and it was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Hmm. All right, let's talk about dragons. Samurg. 
from NSKN Games. Uh, they have games that are chock full of theme, usually. Uh, for example, Exodus, Proxima Centauri is a game of theirs I like very much. Submerg is a game in which you have dragon riders and you are building up a city? or I don't know what you're doing. You're trying to get points. And in this game, it's a worker placement game where you're placing workers all over the board to get different resources. You're trying to get meat and vegetables and spears and scrolls and wood and iron. And then you, you change those resources into other resources and change those resources into other resources. And you're trying to get victory points, and there's various ways to get victory points. And one of the ways to get victory points is to send your dragon riders off on quests. And those are kind of like worker placements, but when you put the worker down, they advance through this quest. There's this area called the wilds that when you place tiles out there, you have these huge tiles in the game. And you place them out there, and it adds a whole bunch of places that people can put workers on. And some of these are quests. And so the places where you put your workers on, there, there's tons of them in this game. And they're all over the place, and they all do different things. And you're changing this for that and trying to get points this way and trying to get things that way. And it's it's very intriguing, and I really like a lot of the things that this game has. But it's almost a little too busy, and hmm. sometimes you're a little too, like, I, I don't really know what to do next. I need iron, so I need the iron from here and do this over here and this here. It's it's a good game. I like it. But it, I think it could have been greater if it had been a little more streamlined. As it is, I think a lot of people are just going to stare at the board for a while going, I don't know what to do at all. Hmm. Just because there's so many places to put your workers. Also, the components are not the best. Um, they they have like these 15 squares that you put your components on and at least half of them don't fit in those squares. Hmm. And then you have these plastic pieces. You know the Litco plastic pieces? Yeah. That's what they use for your workers, which is neat looking, but they look cheap too. I don't know how to explain it. Hmm. So it's a good game. It's just not great because it has some flaws, in, in my opinion, in those hmm. regards. That's Simurg from NSKN. Which is spelled S-I-M-U-R-G-H. Well, duh. In case you're following along at home. <laughs> Continuing on my theme of educational games, uh, I, my, my folks had uh, my son for a week or so over the summer, and they gifted him with an educational game about geography called State Smarts, the card game of national intelligence. It's from a company called Orange Line Games, LLC. And I took one look at this. It doesn't look like much. It's a deck of cards. Um, and I was a little worried. But there's actually a game in here. State Smarts is a rummy-style game. Uh, you are acquiring cards and trying to put them together into sets. You, you sort of have uh, two types of cards. You've got ones that are states, which will have point values on them. But then you'll also have category cards. So there might be one that's uh, U.S. states that are west of the Mississippi, which is a pretty big swath of states. And a lot of states will fit into that category. You may also have ones that are U.S. states that share a border with Canada. And it lists all of the states that fall into these different groups. Uh, but also, you're learning something about these states as you, you put them into groups and try and meld them onto the table to score points. In order to score points, you need states, which have the points on them, but you also need one of these category cards. If you make a meld, you get to draw back up to your hand limit and try and make more melds. Uh, Otherwise, you're simply discarding and drawing and trying to achieve these. What do you keep? What do you get rid of? Some of these categories are, are more likely to pay out for you. So do you hang on to those? But the ones that are more risky might give you bonuses. There was a game in here, uh, and there were some interesting ways to group these states together that make you learn something about them. So again, another pleasant surprise from an educational game with state smarts. The Card Game of National Intelligence. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, that just seems like an interesting game to give to a young boy. Sure. My, my next game is Gum Gum Machine. Now, in this game, you are trying to make gum gums. Gum gums. What is a gum gum? I don't know, but it sounds delicious. Um, well... I'm actually going to look it up now online and see if there is such a thing as a gum gum. Mmm, gum gums. <laughs> it apparently is the premium in-image advertising platform. Mm. 
Oh. Um, oh, yes, you're right. I look up gum gum, and all, I, all I'm seeing here on the internet is um, Easter Island statues. Oh. Yeah, I don't know why. Gum gum. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, you're making gum gums in this game. It's some kind of candy, I think. Mm, gum gum. And basically, you have these pieces that are scattered across this board in a random machine that you make at the beginning of the game. There's different tiles you can put on it to make the machine random. And you're going to flip a lever from one to five, and that flips a switch. The switch moves. You follow a pipe. You go through. As the pipe goes across different pieces of candy, you pick them up. If you come across a symbol, you'll go do that. And you're trying to build a gum gum that has as many different colors as possible. But whenever you pick up a black piece, boom, you're done with gum gum, and then you score it. Of course, the more different colors, the more points you get. Once you score it, you refill the board with more gum gum pieces. And you start over again on your next turn. The first person to get to 30 points is the winner. Hmm. It's pretty cool. You know, there's all these pieces and there's gears and there's pipes and there's a tunnel where you push pieces into and some come out the other end. And I like it. There's a little bit of memory in the game that doesn't seem to match the rest of it. Like, you need to remember that this is there. Okay, that's fine, but... It's it's also trying to find the optimal move on your turn. Which of the five switches is the best one to pick that will help you out and not set up the next person for a really good move? But it but even though it looks super complicated and has all this, it's pretty light. I'm I'm calling it uh, what's the I'm calling it factory fun for for families. Oh okay. Um, it's although it's not quite that, but it does have some cool pieces and some cool things in it, and there's even a spinner in it. Which you rarely see spinners in games these days. Mm-hmm. But I, 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 I liked it. But as a light style game, that is Gum Gum Machine. Gum Gum. Last for me is the game of chess, which is a game that I, I, I'm not really a fan of. Uh, you know, I played it a little bit growing up, but it's never something I have delved into because chess rewards study. And practice, and you know, it's a game that a lot of people play as a dedicated lifestyle game. My son recently joined a chess club at school, and he has learned how to play the game. And he has a dedicated coach who is teaching them strategy. And he's like, "Dad, I know how to checkmate somebody in three moves." And well, I, to be totally honest, I was a little worried to play him. Uh, because I have not done any study in chess. I just sort of play it by ear, and, you know, while I feel like I have a, a general sense of how the game works and, and how to, to think a couple of moves ahead, it's nothing that I have studied in any sort of dedicated way. So, finally, I uh, I gave in to the pressure and, and set up uh, a chess game, and he's like, Dad, I really want to play. I want to play with you. And uh, I was a little nervous. Then I learned that he's still seven, and, um, you know, while he gets excited about the game, which is great. Um, I, I was still able to beat him without too much difficulty. But there will come that time, and I, I almost feel like cataloging this and, and starting to, to write down when we play, because if he keeps working at this, he's going to beat me. But I've decided I'm going to try my hardest to take him out in chess. Huh. See, I'm not sure I agree with this philosophy. Yeah? Because we don't do this in other areas of life. Yeah? If I'm going to play, let's say, basketball against my son when he turns seven, I'm not just going to shoot and score on him every single time. That's true. So why do we do that mentally? So you're saying I should play like without my queen? Yeah, I think so. I think I think I think we should handicap ourselves so that we're playing like an equal game. And then once they beat you, you're like, okay, you're ready to advance to the next level. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. I never understood this whole, like, someday you will beat me, son. And then, but what if they never do? <laughs> does, does that mean they're always going to be dumber than you? Well, you know, I, I think I can pick one game in which I actually get to try. <laughs> Are you saying you're losing a lot of games these days, Eric? It, it, it's quite possible. I want to pick one that I, I at least have a chance of taking him out. Yeah. Well, I just pull out a trick-taking game of Melody, and then I can beat her in that. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, if, I, if I'm if i constantly winning, I'll probably do that. But for the first game, I, I was actually kind of worried that he was going to pull out strategies I had no way of seeing ahead. And if I had, you know, made the fallen into his trap and uh, made that that move where he could have checkmated me in three moves, then, yeah, I, I would have been totally taken aback by it. <laughs> 
He was very disappointed I didn't fall for that little plan. (laughs) All right. Last game I'm going to talk about today is an expansion for Colt Express. Mm. This is Colt Express Horses and Stagecoach. This is a game that adds, well, horses and uh, And stagecoach. It adds a big stagecoach piece, which is running alongside the train at the beginning. And you can jump over to that piece. Jump over to the stagecoach, and you can punch the guy there and take a strong box from him. Ha ha! Hmm. Of course, then that guy runs along the top of the train and uh, makes people take wounds if he runs across them. So they have a marshal on the bottom and a gunman on the top of the train. Hmm. Also, if you go to the bottom of the stagecoach, in the bottom of the stagecoach, you can get a hostage. Hostages are great because they give you like extra money. Like there's one lady who gives you five hundred extra dollars for every jewel you collect. Wow, that's amazing. Though they also give you a handicap. Hmm. Because you're dragging them along with you. Of course. So like one will take away your special ability. One will say you can't – you can only move one space when you're running along the top of the train. That's like this old lady you have with you. One's a photographer. <laughs> and so when you go through a tunnel, you can't play cards face down. You always have to play them face up. Huh. Because the, the flash, flash is going off? The flash keeps going off. It's – you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very humorous thing. And there's one less hostage to number of players, so not everyone's going to get them. Then there's these horses, and these horses basically you jump out of a train and gallop on a horse up to the up to the up to the stagecoach or to another part of the train, and then jump back in. Hmm. It's basically just keeps the movement flowing and stuff. You don't actually sit on the horses, okay. and you can shoot from the stagecoach back. Uh, this was really humorous because we were playing this, and the one guy kept arguing about the realism of the game. <laughs> He's like, "There is no way this game would work." I was like, "Look." He's like, how can you shoot from the stagecoach to the train? I'm like, you can, because you can see it. He's like, yeah, but that's a diagonal shot. It wouldn't work. <laughs> I was like, well, realistically, he's like, oh, are, are we talking realistically here? And I said, okay, movie realistically, you could do that sort of thing. <laughs> then he started going on this long thing about how no one would even accept a woman in a gang of outlaws <laughs> or accept this person. I was like, are you? This is a game. You you got that right. <laughs> Um, but I had a lot of fun <laughs> despite all that. Uh, but also add some no- more scenario cards, you know, the different things that you're going through each turn. And sometimes everyone has to play a card at the same time, and then you flip them over and add them to the pile one at a time. Hmm. It doesn't add a lot, but it adds a little bit, and it's Cold Express was already really fun. This adds a little bit of fun and also just looks cool. Do you have Cold Express, Eric? I, I do, uh, although the, the copy, I got both Cold Express and the expansion at Essen, and I... Uh, took everything and, and put it into the Colt Express box unassembled. I have not put the, the, the cars together yet. And I don't know if I, – I may have totally hampered myself because I don't know if the stagecoach is going to fit in the box with all the uh, other cars. They told me it will fit in the box. You may have to take the insert out though. Okay. I haven't tried yet. I haven't put it all together yet. They said but, it will fit in. Okay. All right. Well – You You, you promised. That's the Cold Express expansion, and we keep talking about an episode of Hype, and Eric decides to talk about Sooth and Chess. <laughs> um, <laughs> now let's, let's continue on with that theme, but then we'll talk about something new. Here's okay. a couple of our contributors. Welcome to Cult of the Old, where I discuss games we may have forgotten about, or games that fail miserably, but still had some good mechanics in them. This is Brian Counter, and everything I do is counterproductive. Today, I wanted to briefly talk about Cats and Jammer Blues. It's a Reiner game, developed in 1998, rated ranked 5.90 and 3835 on Board Game Geek. Perhaps one of the lowest rated games I'm talking about, but here you go. Now, I didn't intend to start a trick-taking series with games like Nyet, Vashtikt, and Cats and Jammer Blues, but this one's pretty simple. The premise is that you're doing cool cat quartets, not inspired by Eric Dewey of On Board Games, and you're playing quartets of cards, four ones, twos, three, fours, or fives, and there are some joker cards as well. To meld, or to lay on the table, you need four of one particular kind, and because your music is so cool, whatever number is associated, the one, two, three, four, or five, that's how many mice you attract over to your little playgroup, And once the mice run out, game is over. Whoever has the most mice wins. Then, of course, whoever has the most jokers, you lose five mice. Of course, jokers are like any other game. You can use them to pair up if you have three fours and a joker. Then it becomes a quartet of fours. It's just you keep the jokers, and at the end of the game, whoever has the most gets the penalty. Now, the way you get cards back into your hand is by bidding. The dealer will flip cards up on the table until a double is hit. For example, a two, a three, four, and a two. You stop at the two, and then you bid on those four cards with cards from your own hand. The 
winning bid goes in the discard, and then you take the cards that are on the table into your own hand. Also, if a joker comes up, everyone gets a free card off the top of the deck, but more on that later. Now, every time you win a bid, you can lay down a mill, but you don't have to. You can hold on to them for later. However... If you hold on to them for too long, you may not get a chance to play them anyway. Now, this game gets no love on Board Game Geek, and to a degree, I understand why. If you get dealt a higher number of jokers, either at the beginning or through the game, you have no control over that, and you're going to take that five mice penalty at the end of the game. Even the self-proclaimed lover of randomness understands that that's not a great mechanic. However, I'd argue that the game is short enough to where that shouldn't make a whole lot of difference can be used as a good filler closer, that kind of thing. Now, if I'm going to rank all of the games I've covered lately, it would be Fashtik first, followed closely behind my Niet, and then a little bit of a distance, and then Cats and Jammer Blues. Long out of print, but you can still find a couple of copies on Board Game Geek if interested. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. Notwithstanding the posters for the Ares Project and Space Cadets hanging in my office, I typically keep my business and gaming lives somewhat separate. My lunch schedule is erratic, so I don't have a lunchtime gaming group or anything like that. However, I have been on the lookout for a way to improve communication and teamwork within the organization and thought that a game might be the way to do it, but the games that I play that involve those topics are not really conducive to teaching and playing quickly, which is what I was looking for. And most of the so-called training games that you find online or in books are just terrible and I don't find very effective. I thought about using code names, which is very simple to explain and play, and it is teams, but it doesn't really teach the type of communication skills that we use on a regular basis. But I think that at last I have found my training tool, a game called Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. It's a computer game rather than a board game, but it's got physical components, so it's almost a hybrid. It's an incredibly innovative and fun design. So what is Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes? In it, your team has to defuse a bomb within a time limit. One person on the team is the bomb defuser, and the others give out instructions on what to do. The defuser sits in front of a computer screen and can actually see and manipulate the bomb. The other players on the team sit in an area where they can't see the screen and have a physical bomb defusal manual, which runs about 25 pages long. This has instructions on which wires to cut, which buttons to press, and more. And you'll need to do different things depending on what the button, wires, and bomb look like. For example, there may be a big button which says abort. You may have to press it and release, or press it and hold it until something happens, or just not press it at all. The instruction manual tells you what you need to do, but it will depend on the color of the button, sounds that are made, or other information on the bomb. So the team with the book needs to make sure they get the information from the bomb diffuser, and the diffuser needs to clearly convey to the rest of the team what they are seeing and hearing so that they can give the right instructions. And you can set all kinds of parameters for the games, like how long you have to defuse the bomb, the number and complexity of the modules that need to be disarmed, and more to make it as easy or difficult as you would like. And so far, I've run the exercise with three different teams. We've been doing simple introductory bombs that give you five minutes to defuse, and you have three different modules on the bomb to deal with. I've been putting the diffuser in the group with the instruction manual in different rooms and having them communicate over a speakerphone. And the game itself is very simple to teach, since part of the game is literally looking at the instructions to figure out what to do. I give as little information as possible to the group and find it really fascinating to watch the group dynamics develop during the brief duration of the game. Each person gets a copy of the manual, so some groups split up reading, some work together on everything, sometimes someone will just shut down and not contribute at all, or another might dominate. And it's amazing when you hear the diffuser and instruction team not truly hearing what the other is saying. Sometimes there's a critical piece of information which is said but not picked up on or completely misunderstood. Every group has had a blast with it so far, no pun intended, and I think has really learned something. We make sure that afterwards we do a debrief and talk about what worked and what didn't. We talk about listening and asking the right questions. We also discuss how it would be easier if they were in the same room. Even if the folks with the manual can't see the screen, nonverbal cues like gestures make it easier to explain what you see and what needs to be done. The whole process takes about 15 to 20 minutes, which means you can easily fit it into a normal day without much planning. And now we've got groups that want to tackle it again and try harder bombs or try to solve the ones they failed at the first time around. 
I'm hopeful that this will really assist their teamwork and communication in the real world. I actually am very skeptical and cynical about the usual corporate team building exercises, but I found keep talking and nobody explodes to be engaging and instructive. If you're looking to build teamwork in your group, I highly recommend it. And if you have any other ideas for games that would work well for this purpose, please let me know. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. I have to say, Eric, I'm really pumped about trying this game out. I really, I mean, everyone's talking about it, but this sounds like a, a blast to play. I, I, it sounds similar to what was it, Space Team, that app that people could play that they had to flip their devices over and turn switches, and you had to talk to each other a lot, but maybe a little more focused. My only, my only problem with this game is the fact that I was, I, I watched them playing it on the board game Geek twenty four hour thing, and I was like, oh, we gotta get that. And then they needed a PC to run it, hmm. and I only have a Mac. And I know someone's going to email me and say, but you can make your Mac into a PC. No, thanks. Um, not, not just for, to play this. No, I'm that's surprised the thing. that it's, it, it's not out on iOS. Maybe it will be. I'm, I'm sure if you wait long enough, something like that will happen. And hmm. if that's the case, then, I'll, then I'll, I'll gladly play it. So, But I guess you'd still need to print out the manual somehow. Oh, you have to print the manuals out? I thought you bought them and they sent them to you. No, I think you, I, I think you print them out. Oof. Okay. Printing stuff's expensive. You think that in the year 2015, <laughs> we would have got that down a lot cheaper? Ink is expensive. Is ink made out of gold? I still don't understand why it's so expensive. I think it's small flecks of gold, yes. Mm, okay. All right. And diamonds crushed up. That's horrific. Speaking of which. And now, another tale of board gaming horror. Gather round, children. My friends John and James were over, and we decided to play my recently purchased Cosmic Encounter. After explaining the rules, I mentioned that although you can have a shared victory, it will all be sweeter if you are able to win it for yourself. The three of us were halfway into the game when I noticed that any time John or James had an option to attack anyone they wanted, they chose me. As the usual host of game night, this was not uncommon, so I simply made a few joking comments about it and continued on. The game ended in a joint victory between John and James. A few weeks later, the same two friends were over, and we played another game of Cosmic Encounter. Yet again, I was attacked any time they had a choice, and John claimed victory. A month after that, we played again with an additional friend, and this time James won. Soon after, John moved, and we rarely saw him. About a year later, I had a New Year's party with John and some other friends. The subject of Cosmic Encounter came up, and I joked how I love the game, even though I rarely win. John said, oh well, that's because James and I secretly teamed up against you. Puzzled, I asked him, wait, do you mean you purposely were trying to make sure I didn't win? The room got a bit tense. John replied, well, we just tried to have a shared victory, and if we couldn't, we made sure one of us won. We only did it three or four times. I thought about how long it had been since I gamed with John, and I checked my board game stats app. I told John, I've only played three games of Cosmic with you. John replied, It's only a game. <laughs> I love Cosmic Encounter. Wow. But you should never play with three players. Never. I think it's Ever. more to learn that, you know, there was a secret pact against you every time you played the game. Oh, that's hilarious, actually. <laughs> and then this guy seems like, well, it's just a game. It's just, you know, it's Cosmic Encounter. This sort of thing happens. I think it's funny, though, that he has that app. He pulls it out. Oh, wait, hang on. Let me check. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm looking across this time. See, that's one of the reasons I don't keep stats of games. Mm -hmm. It's because I like to keep that stuff nebulous. Uh, yeah. If you actually knew how many times Jason beat you. Yeah. I do remember the times I beat him, though. <laughs> All the sweeter. <laughs> so you remember those more, and you remember the times you lost less, and so you feel like you it's, it's about equal. That's right. Well, hey, let's talk about board game clubs. And now, the ins and outs of forming a board game group. 
with Dan Hughes. Hello, Dan Hughes here from the Noble Order of Huddersfield Board Gamers. And I'm here today to continue my ongoing series about how to set up your own board gaming club. This week, I'm going to be talking about that all-important thing, how to get members for your club. Before we get into all the nitty-gritty of all that sort of stuff, though, I'd just like to give you a word of caution. It may seem rather counterintuitive, but it's very important not to let your club grow too quickly. You don't want too many members too soon. The reasons for this are pretty simple. In any gaming club, you can have two broad types of people. You can have people who are into the hobby and own collections and know rules and are able to teach rules. And then you can have people who enjoy gaming but aren't into it neck deep quite yet. They don't own any games, or if they do, it's only one or two. And they don't feel quite as confident in teaching it to other people. Now, I'd argue that it's essential to have both those types of people attending a board game club. A games night full of alpha players, where everyone brings a game along and is desperate to get to the table, could end up being quite stressful. But the flip side of that is, if nobody knows how to play any games, and nobody's bringing any along, then you can end up having quite a lot of games of charades and noughts and crosses. That's tic-tac-toe for the chronically American. So in an ideal world, you're going to want a ratio of around one games enthusiast to two or three more casual gamers. Obviously, in reality, there's no actual way of you being able to have that kind of control over the ratios of the types of games that come, not unless you're some kind of horrific micromanaging dictator type person. However, it's worth bearing in mind, especially when you're starting up your group. So don't put that advert in the national papers just yet. Start from a small kernel and build up over time. Let your numbers grow organically. It's far, far healthier to have one or two new members each games night than to have a big influx of 20 people all at once. It means the group can welcome the new people properly and get to know them and make them feel at home. Now, that's all well and good, but how do you get that kernel of people in the first place? Well, what I did with the Noble Order of Huddersfield board gamers was start with the people I already knew. I didn't have an official board gaming group, but I did have a number of friends that I had played board games with through the years. So I created a Facebook group, gave it a silly name, the Noble Order of Huddersfield Board Gamers, found a venue, decided on a time, and sent out a big invite to all my friends. And surprisingly enough, it worked. I had about six people turn up and we played two games of three people each. Everyone seemed to enjoy themselves and said they'd come back next time. Then I got to work, slowly building the membership. I encouraged existing members to invite their own friends along. I invited some of my friends who hadn't previously shown any interest in board gaming. I scoured the regional forums of Board Game Geek and various subreddits and pounced on anyone who said they were from the local area and were looking for games. I also built up very friendly relations with other local board gaming groups and we all actively encouraged for our memberships to overlap, building up a big regional community of board gamers. Other things we did include getting our local friendly game store to advertise our games nights on their webpage and also making sure that we had a good web presence ourselves. Initially, I set up a website, however, I soon discovered that a very vibrant Facebook group is far better and shows up just as well on a search on Google. We did consider using Meetup, and I know that's Tom's favourite way of advertising board game groups. However, it costs money, and that somewhat sticks in my throat as a Yorkshireman, so we never bothered. Another good way of getting your group's name out there is to try and wheedle your way onto a popular podcast, and then subtly try and mention your group's name as often as possible. The Noble Order of Huddersfield Board Gamers. In fact, there are loads of creative ways of getting new members for your board gaming club. So why not go to the Dice Tower Guild over on Board Game Geek and share your own ideas with people? And that's about it from me. Next time, I'm going to be talking about if you should set up a code of conduct for your group. Thanks for listening. Okay, folks, I wanted to talk a little bit about the GTS trade day that I went to, hmm. uh, well, at this point, like almost two months ago. Uh-huh. Um, this is the – they call it the come and play day. GTS Distribution is one of the companies that distributes games. The publishers sell to GTS who then sells them to all the different stores all across the nation and in, in the United States. GTS is probably the second largest of the board game distributors, the largest being Alliance. There's other ones, mm-hmm. uh, uh, ACD and Southern Hobby. There's I think like six major ones. Okay. So GTS brought me in. I came in. Rodney Smith was also there from Watch It Played, and he was showing off different things, and um, people were, like, showing different games to him, and he was videoing them. And I kind of went around and just looked around and saw how everything went. 
Now, at the uh, at one of these game days, the way that these things work is a bunch of retailers will come. I'd say between 100 and 200 retailers show up, and a bunch of publishers come. And the retailers will go to many different seminars where the publishers are going to say, hey, this is what we're coming out with this year. These are some of the store events that we're planning, this organized play you can have in your store. And then mm-hmm. the uh, store owners can ask them questions and things. Then there's also like a little – basically like a little exhibition hall where they'll show off games. This isn't a place where people are selling games per se, although you can – like the stores can go make like purchase orders and say I'd like to buy a certain number of copies of games from you. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, it is it, it is a closed convention. It's not open to the public. It's mostly for retailers and publishers to – you know, meet with each other, and then the distributors there making everything happen because all these publishers distribute their games through GTS. Hmm. So that was pretty neat. It was it was a very quiet thing. It, it it's very similar, Eric, and feel to the Gamma Trade Show. Gamma that we Trade went Show. To. That, that that's what I was going to say. It sounds like a similar, maybe more focused version of the Gamma Trade Show. Yeah, well, the Gamma Trade Show was is probably, from what I understand, it's the biggest of these things. Hmm. Because the, all the distributors come <laughs> to that show, and a lot of publishers go to that show. While, like for example, the GTS show, the Z-Man Games was not there because they're exclusive currently through Alliance. Okay, right. So you won't see all the publishers, and some publishers just don't have time to go to all these different shows. There's lots of these different trade shows at the different things. I was really glad to have gone because it gave me time to talk to publishers and and uh, even store owners and just feel out, you know, what's it's like running different stores across across America. And just talk to different people. And so I got to play some games when I was there. And they, they had like a game night where they demo the games and show off different games. And that was entertaining and fun. It was in Atlanta, Georgia. And so and, – and, and GTS was just they, – they were so very gracious. They had catered dinners and I was like, oh, OK. And I went to the catered dinner and it was really good. Hmm. It was the best catered dinner I've been to like at an event like this. And when it was over, the very last day, they let the retailers go shop in their warehouse. Oh. Now, GTS has 10 warehouses across America. This is – this one wasn't even their biggest one. It's This is where their headquarters is. Uh, but it, this wasn't their biggest warehouse. And I'll tell you what, though. It was big. And so you, these retailers had these carts going up and down the aisles, and I'm just looking at all the games, lots of games. Eric, you've seen the Cool Stuff warehouse. Yeah. This is about maybe – Fifty percent larger. Okay. Yeah, you would have loved it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was just a lot of fun to see all these games and to see all these people. And these things are very interesting because the distributor is the thing that people don't know a lot about, right? Everyone thinks about the publisher and they think about their store, but someone actually has to get the games from the publisher to the store. Right. The logistics aspect. The store doesn't have time to go to every single publisher and say, these are the games I want. The distributors also can help the publisher figure out which games will sell for them. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad I went to this. I don't know how many of these different trade shows I would be able to go to over the course of a year. Um, definitely going to go to the Gamma Trade Show. Maybe I'll go to some of the other distributor trade shows at some point or other. I don't know. Maybe I'll go back to the GTS one. I don't know. But I had a good time. I was able to hang out a little bit with Rodney Smith, who is a very great guy, um, even if he does uh, beat me up in board games. <laughs> Hung out with Steve Avery, who lives in Atlanta, and showed up because, well, why not? <laughs> and then there's a couple companies that are based around the area, like Cool Money or Not is based in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. So they were there in full force and showing off the upcoming things. And it was exciting just to see some of the stuff that's coming out in the future. And I tweeted a lot of it, so a lot of the news that I found out there – that I can uh, talk about <laughs> is there, but there's also it's also like a big networking thing. So they have like um you know get-togethers at night and um uh, a get-together over here and people are all going around and making contacts and business cards are being handed out all over the place. A very business thing. Don't if you're listening to this, don't be jealous that you're not at one of these things. Yeah. But if you're into board gaming business at all, these are not these. I would certainly go out of my way to try to go to some of these. So that's what I did at the GTS game show. Okay. Let's now hear. <laughs> I've added yet another type of tale. Yeah. Tale of outrage! At a recent away game day at an acquaintance's house, 
capitalizing on the generally fun and jovial tone following consecutive energetic games of panic on Wall Street, I decided to try my, our, luck with introducing Shadows Over Camelot to this group of eight mostly eager gamers and non-gamers. I kept rules as succinct as possible, and the game was on. The knights of the round quickly began their questing to save Camelot, mostly incognizant of the possible two traitors in our midst. Turns were bumpy at first, but gradually sped up as familiarity with the rules was cemented among the players. About a quarter into the game, through an accusation, one player, Josh, revealed their loyalty card, proving beyond doubt that their intentions were pure. A few failed quests and siege engines later, facing dire straits, another new player asked for counsel on a set of tactical choices he had to make. This player, Lee, asked Josh for his opinion due to his open position and followed his advice on the matter. On a subsequent turn, the end game nearing and the situation grim for the loyal knights, Josh outwardly speculated that Lee might in fact be a traitor. Things just got real. Lee, flabbergasted that his motives would be questioned by none other than the only proven loyal player, quickly defended himself, explaining how his actions had been more heroic than any other player at the table, repeatedly taking damage rather than advancing evil, and generally seeking advice from other players on difficult decisions, which were made for the greater good. Josh's skepticism did not subside, perhaps due in part to a couple games of Werewolf played earlier in the evening, and he once again loudly pondered if he should spend his formal accusation on Lee at this critical juncture of the game. And so the camel's back broketh. Lee, red with indignation, loudly proclaimed that Josh should, in fact, use his accusation on him to prove his innocence— Worded less kindly than that, I assure you. A deathly silence fell upon the table after this passionate, angry outburst from Lee. This group had responded well to other social deduction and negotiation games earlier that day, so I figured Shadows could build on that success. But this had gone too far. After the two players in question were reminded that this is just a game, Josh withdrew his allegation, and we reluctantly, quietly, awkwardly continued the game under Lee's repeated protests of, This game makes me very mad, is as nicely as I can paraphrase the sentiment. The traitors, neither of which were Josh or Lee, uneventful victory via siege engines, soon followed. I was devastated as I packed up the game. A stalwart emissary of gaming, I always intend to provide fun, meaningful experiences that have players regaling recent exploits and commenting on the intrigue as fellow game players. Not the debacle that had just transpired, whose painful and unwelcoming conclusion could possibly turn some of the new players off gaming forever. Surprisingly, the tense atmosphere dissipated almost immediately after Shadows was over, but I still felt the weight of my decision to spring such a game on unsuspecting new players. Only myself and one other had played before. Just as I was mentally vowing to never again make such a risky game choice with the uninitiated, Lee, who had been silent since the end of the game, spoke up. It seemed, upon further reflection, You know, if I got that angry, it was because I was able to really, you know, get into that game. That's the sign of a good game. We should play it again sometime. I must have gone cross-eyed. I don't even. <laughs> All right, folks, I'm calling on you on this one. If you have a tale, I want to hear tales of people flipping game tables, <laughs> of not speaking to each other for 10 years. Come on, there's got to be great stories about that. Uh. Or maybe... Terrible stories about that. Whatever. Throwing water in another player's face, perhaps? I've never done that. I'm, I'm just a spectator at these things, Eric. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. Nothing. I have seen this, though. I was in a werewolf game one time where a guy was so adamant that when someone, someone said he was a werewolf, he threw a chair Whoa. on the ground and screamed he was not a werewolf. And then we were all like, well, we can't, like... You know, vote the guy for being a werewolf now because he might, you know, kill somebody. <laughs> Turned out he was a werewolf. He was a werewolf? Wow. Yeah. That's kind of uncool. Well. To just get totally belligerent? 
it was very interesting. And this was one of those games. This is when I this was over a decade ago, and I I still remember because I was sitting there and I was talking everything out loud. It's like okay, this this, and I was like, wow, it was all coming together. Wait a minute, if you did this and you did this, I'm like. Oh wait a minute! I know who the werewolves are, and it was like, yeah. And then I they killed me <laughs> the next night. And I realized that if you know all this stuff, maybe you should not say it all out loud. Yep. <laughs> oh well. That's why I'm the moderator now. Yeah. Sure. All right. Send us your tales of outrage. I want to hear them. One place you right. definitely don't want to have a tantrum is in a children's board game club. Hello, and welcome to the Board Game Club with Tom Kendrick. Ahoy hoy, this is Tom Kendrick with the Board Game Club, a show designed to give you the tips and tricks needed to make your own board game club for kids. This week we're looking at Catan, formerly known as Settlers of Catan, designed in 1995 by Klaus Teuber. One of the cornerstones of modern gaming, I was interested to see how children would pick it up. Catan sees the players settling an island broken into regions of wood, brick, sheep, wheat, metal, and one barren desert. The players will have settlements placed near these regions to collect resources. The players will then spend these resources to build roads, more settlements, cities, and purchase a variety of development cards. Each turn a player will roll two dice and the result will dictate which regions will produce which resources. A roll of seven will produce nothing but allow the player to move the dreaded robber who will steal a resource from another player and prevent his new region from generating resources until he moves again. Catan ends when one player scores 10 victory points through a combination of settlement cities and having the longest road and then development cards. One of the biggest problems with teaching Catan is that the players have to make the game defining decisions right at the beginning, where their initial settlements and roads may go. Some heavy-handed advice was required, since if the players got the decision wrong, they can put themselves into a miserable position. However, once the game got going, it's a very simple procedure. Roll the dice. Can I build something? Yes. Build it. No. Try and trade to build it. The trade aspect was something the kids picked up on really well. With some ideas pumped in from myself, you could trade now, to owe later, haggle them down, offer a better trade, etc. This interaction really boosted the game for the kids, with them building up their little empires, grudges and alliances. The game has a good sense of progression, with more settlements or upgraded cities resulting in more resources. The little victories of, yes, now my city will produce all the wood, and finally I've got some brick, keeps the players engaged. The tactic of road blocking and port trading allows the children who want a more tactical game to find their enjoyment, while those who are looking for a lighter game can easily play it that way. The game wasn't finished during this first session and was played on to the next weeks. One of the awkward things I find with Catan is that the ending tends to lack a certain drama. I've got ten victory points, goes the cry. Oh, goes everyone else. The end. I know there can be dramatic endings, but I just haven't tended to see those. It can be a bit of a damp squid for the group, and I think the kids enjoyed the journey far more than the destination. However, given that Catan isn't a short game, the journey is most of the game. Here's a board game club tip. It's possible, even probable, that in your club you'll introduce games that will last longer than the club itself does, particularly if you're only running for an hour. Now, of course, you can get round this by playing lighter, shorter games, but I feel that's a bit of an injustice when you consider the classic games that be, may be removed. I know there are people who would shudder at the idea of Ticket to Ride or Catan lasting more than an hour, but realistically, when teaching it to a full complement of kids who've just done a day at school and, in, and like to engage in plenty of table talk, you're usually looking at more than an hour. The method I've worked out is to have the kids leave the game as it is, then once they've all gone, take a photo of the main board and each player's area, so their resources, cards, money, etc. If possible, it's also great to be able to bag up a player's area individually. Then, before the next session, I printed the photos off, and the kids were able to put together most of the game, with my help only needed on some of the finer parts. Next time, we'll take a look at what became the group's favourite game by far, Jungle Speed. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to hear more, you can check me out on Off The Cuff Gaming on YouTube. It's time for the Dice Towers Question of the Week, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., in which our team of gaming experts answers one of your questions, thus increasing the odds that someone will get it right. This week's question, how do you deal with board game hype? Hi, this is Marty and Tony from Rolling Dice and Taking Names. And for me, hype helps bring exposure to games I might not otherwise know about. So in my case, it doesn't necessarily hurt anything, and just because a game is hyped doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to go out and buy it, but it definitely makes me want to try it. How about you, Tony? 
For me, Marty, hype gives me calls for concern. I'm always worried about it. Everybody says it's the greatest and best thing out there. But for me, hype just makes me kind of stand back and say, hmm, let me watch this and see where it goes. So hype on the other side, it's kind of a negative effect for me. Hello, hello. You guys at Subject Portal Games. And Stephen Bonaco of Stronghold Games. We are Board Games Insider. And of course, I am a gamer, so hype works on me, and I'm getting super excited when I see an advertisement of a great new games. I absolutely take a look at, at the crazy hyped games. It makes me take the look, and then I decide, based on that look, whether or not that game is really for me. Hello, my friends. It's the Game Boy Geek here. Hype before a game comes out does not affect me. I only buy into any hype if someone's actually played a production version. With that being said, in that case, if there's a lot of hype going on, it will move it up my list as to how fast I want to get to play it and how excited I'll be before it, but it won't affect my end opinion. In fact, it will actually make it harder for me to like a game because the expectations are so high with the hype. This is Jared from Board Game Breakfast. So, we've all been stung by the hype monster. I've learned that I shouldn't get excited about a game until I've actually played it, or at least seen a, a review of it online. We might get excited about a theme and then feel disappointed when we see it implemented badly. <coughs> Firefly. <coughs> the best slash worst example of this for me was the Pathfinder Adventure card game. Everything Pathfinder's touched has seemed to be gold, and I bought way more of their minis than I will ever need, but the card game was overhyped and ultimately a disappointment. There's no connection between your effort and your reward. If I want to experience that, I don't need a game to do it. I have my life. On behalf of the four corners of the board, we bring you gray and green. Hype is perhaps the most detrimental thing ever to any games. I was fooled once as a child with Topple, and since then I've been scarred forever. The more hype on a game, the less likely I am to even try it in the first six months it's out. And this is Graham with the four corners of the board. I was burned early on in my gaming career by hype. So I'm very wary of it now. Hype draws me to a game, but it also makes me more skeptical of the game, and I do a lot more research when there's a lot more hype around the game. Hello everyone, Luke from The Broken Meeple, and if you've kept up with my reviews, you know that I cannot stand hype. I hate it with a passion. Hype has destroyed the first impressions for people, not just me, other reviewers and players out there. Dead and Winter was my biggest disappointment when it came to a hyped game. I should have adored it. Yet I didn't find it that great, and then I couldn't understand why everybody was praising it to hell and back. It's just, why do these games get hyped so much? I mean, some of the times they are really good games, and that's fair enough. But I think that some people get a little bit misled by hype, and how it can affect their impressions of whether they should like a game or not. Personally, I say take hype with a pinch of salt. You've got Scythe going for the motions, you've had Pandemic Legacy and Time Stories hyped like crazy. In the end, I would say just look at the game for yourself and make up your own mind. Don't succumb to the hype that the world generates. It's your decision. You know what you like in games. Do you think it will do well? That's up to you. Hello, Dan Hughes here from the Noble Order of Huddersfield Board Gamers. Now, I'd be a little bit naive if I said that hype doesn't affect my own board gaming purchases. It's very difficult to ignore a game that everybody's talking about. However, when it comes to Kickstarter, lots of hype often has a complete opposite effect on me. I become belligerent and resentful and start muttering about people only being excited about a game because they've invested in it without really knowing how it plays. Stupid Kickstarter hype. <laughs> Hello chaps, Barry here, and there's nothing worse than having your bubble popped because of hype. This has happened to me twice this year already. The first time it was with Time Stories, a cooperative choose-your-own-adventure with very limited replayability. But I'd already played a cooperative choose-your-own-adventure-style game called Seventh Continent, and it has lots of replayability. Also, on a side note, if a good friend tells you that they bought, played, and sold Time Stories all in the course of one day, is a good indication that it's not up to the hype. Another game that I really wanted to have in my collection because it's hundreds of games all in one box, which is great for holidays, is 504. But after seeing it at Essen, I wanted to empty the contents of my stomach. There on the table was 504, and it looked like somebody had emptied the contents of their stomach. There. Hey everyone, it's Mark Zelensky. Ah, uh, hype. Yes, with so many games on the market, everyone is trying to stand out from the crowd, and there is so much hype nowadays. Going on with games is just unbelievable. Have I been burned by hype? Yes, I would say Dungeon Roll. I bought into the hype on that one. The Die Rolling Dungeon Diver, but that's really not a game. It's kind of just a parallel play 
solo adventures, you know. I mean, not much of a game there. Uh, but I do like the hype. I like to see what's going on. I like to be part of the hype machine and see what's going on. You just have to pay attention and try to filter out the good from the bad from all the information you're getting. So, hype, bring it on. This is Brian from Cult of the Old. Hype may get my attention, but it also makes me a little wary that I'm going to be flim-flammed by all this hype machine garbage. I'm a cautious buyer, and that has served me quite well over the years, and I'll wait for the hype to die down and investigate more about a game before I actually buy it, with a couple exceptions. But typically speaking, not a fan of hype. I love how Ignacy and Steven are like, yeah, we love hype. That's great. They shouldn't, they shouldn't even have been allowed to answer this question, Eric. <laughs> I mean, they did sort of say, you know, outside of their board game business, they they enjoy it as well. I love hype. I, I'm a sucker for hype. We've we've discussed this before. I think it builds excitement. It lets me know about something that's that's new and different. Um, I'm probably more guilty of spreading it than than a lot of people. We I made fun of you, Tom, earlier, but I I get pretty pretty much hype machine. I, I get to get to spread the word on stuff I'm excited about as well. Um, and yes, it can bite you. You know, you get excited about something and it's not quite what you expected. But sometimes it, it brings up a, a game or a different perspective on a game or new mechanisms that, that are really worth getting excited about. And it alerts you to something that's new and different. So I'm willing to take the occasional hit on the hype machine in order to find the cool new games. Yes, okay, so let's take myself out of this as someone who talks about the games all the time. Uh, uh-huh. And let's look at myself as a board game player. Hype is exciting. And let's say they just announced uh, a few weeks ago the Star Wars Rebellion. Yes. Ah! They showed plastic miniatures of the Executor and Death Star and the Millennium Falcon and ah! – <laughs> <laughs> okay. Isn't there a there's a Death Star that's like there's the episode four Death Star and the episode six Death Star, right? Ah, yes. So <laughs> right. So that's very exciting. And then you like who's a designer? And then people start talking about it, and that gets you hyped up more. So let me take you out of things that uh, board games, and let's talk about something that I'm not steeped in: movies. Okay. So I see a movie trailer, and I'm like, wow, that looks really amazing. And then people go watch the movie. I'm usually not the first to go watch movies because I just don't have a lot of time to do that sort of thing. And I'll read mm-hmm. reviews, and reviews are really good. I'm like, oh. And I, and I know how to – and then when I go in and see it and it's not what I – I should say not good, but I don't like it. Yeah. It is a big drop there. I'm like everyone That's said true. that was good. And this happens mm-hmm. occasionally with a game. I'll play a game. Mysterium is a good example. Everyone said yep. they loved it. And they played it way before I did. I, I didn't play that – Back in the, you know, the Polish version, and when I played, I was like, "Okay, this is good," but it, wow! I, and I always feel like this big downfall after it's been hyped up. Hmm. But I don't. But I, I work really hard at not letting that affect my enjoyment of the game overall. Um, at the same time, I do think that there is artificial hype going on in the board gaming industry, and that I despise. Yeah, when people are like faking enthusiasm. This 10-card game is the greatest game ever. It is not. <laughs> Look me in the face. Get a lie detector test on right now. You tell me that card. It's a micro game. It's cool. It is not the greatest game ever. Yeah. You don't even believe that. But you're saying it, and everyone's saying it. And they're like, Or a little group of people say something a lot. That's advertising. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, it's hard to spot that sort of thing, too. I mean, because because real hype is so elusive to actually get a real group of people to genuinely respond to something, to connect with something, and that's the real hype that you're going for. There are lots of ways to try and manufacture that, um, and sometimes it's hard to spot the promotional hype from the real hype. Yeah... <laughs> It is tough too, and it's it's kind of tough because there's just so much hype going on for everything. Because if you want your game to be noticed, you got to hype it up, and if mm-hmm. you want your Kickstarter to be funded, you really got to hype that up. Yeah. Um. I, I, I'm I'm not opposed to hype at the same time, right? We should we should. I think you know, obviously, when I when I love a game, I'm going to tell you it's amazing, and I don't care. It's great. I just think that as ourselves, we got to be wary of hype for things. 
viral mm-hmm. videos, right? There's viral yeah. board games in a sense. Everyone starts talking about it. Suddenly it's like everyone's playing it. Well, I better play it too. We don't have to get caught up in that sort of thing. At the same time, I don't think we should be the hipster or the anti-hype person either. <laughs> Everyone loves it. It's not cool anymore. Stupid. I like that before everyone else did. Or even if yeah, everyone likes it, so yeah, there's no way. I mean, I've noticed so many threads on the internet lately about people who are telling me how much they don't like Star Wars and don't understand the hype. I get it. <laughs> you don't like Star Wars. It's fine. You're allowed. Shut up. Yeah. Stop telling me Let you don't else like enjoy something. <laughs> so that happens with games too. Like I would say the most hyped game probably right now is Pandemic Legacy. As of, mm, as of sure. us recording this episode, it's at like 19 on the Board Game Geek rankings. Wow. It's probably much higher than that now. And so – because a lot of people like it. But there's a bunch of people – stupid game. Shouldn't be that high in the rankings. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Let yeah. it go. Let it go. <laughs> oh, he's singing again. I am. That was like, that was like two episodes ago, Eric. Uh, last episode you sang too. It's becoming a theme. Literally. Huh. Is it bad? No, no. I just don't want the Disney lawyers on us. <laughs> well, when they do their internet search for the music, my rendition, the notes will not match. <laughs> yeah, their algorithm their will algorithm, totally so pass you by. I'm totally fooling them by singing poorly. <laughs> You're brilliant, Tom. Well done. <laughs> All righty, folks. Well, we come to an end of another episode. What does the future hold? Well, I'll tell you what the future holds. This episode is being posted – is it after Thanksgiving? Uh, yes. yes. So I hope everyone here had a happy Thanksgiving. If you live in America, if you live in Canada, you've had your Thanksgiving ages ago. And if you live in other countries, you have other holidays and such. And – but all over the world, Christmas is coming. The goose is getting fat. December is coming. So there's a couple things that you, we can look forward to. We will be running our annual Kickstarter in January, but that's still a month away. We'll talk about that True. in a bit. But the top, the best stuff of the year, that's coming soon, folks. Yeah. So pay attention for that. We look forward to talking about that. It's one. It's my favorite thing to do every year is to look back at the whole year. We've hopefully at this point have played enough games to give you an accurate thing of that. Since we are recording this after Beach G-Con, and it's Eric's job to go to Beach G-Con and play every game he has not played yet from 2015. Okay, just play the important ones. Okay. (laughs) All righty, folks. Well, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 434, was recorded on November 12th, 2015. Coming up next week, it's our top 10 games from AEG. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has turned your game upside down, Find out how we can help at jackvassal.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me, with assistance from Jason Roth, Yutai Perez, Eric Matthews, and Rob Searing. Eavesdropping Horses provided by Spyfold. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at coolstuffinc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, liking us on Facebook, or by emailing us at thedicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including Boards and Swords, Start Space, On Board Games, The Game Pit, The Long View, The Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast, and Board Game University. Find out more at DicetowerNetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. Maybe if you play them in alphabetical order, how far do you think you would get? Just at BGGCon, I probably got to A. <laughs> yeah, there's so many games. No, I don't even think you get to A, Eric, because you'd be stuck in 504. I mean, st- <laughs> you're right. You're absolutely right. You start I with really the can't evaluate it until I played at least 100 of them. <laughs> yeah.